on YouTube later this week. So, so many people couldn't attend the class live. They're out of town or just couldn't make it work today. So um, you'll have all of this uh, information up on YouTube later on. Um, if you'd like, we can go ahead and pour the, um, the first one, the Occam's Razor. Give yourself a big old glass and I'll introduce Pinto and then I'll let you um, take over the show. Um, I'm so excited to have you. This is the first time I've been able to do anything like this with a winemaker. So thank you so much. They're in the middle of harvest. It's, I know from, y'all know my stories of harv working harvest last year in Oregon. So you know how much work it is. And I can't even imagine like during COVID as well, how that has changed everything for you. So thank you so much for your time. We love your wines down here, and um, I can go ahead and share the um, screen now uh, for the PowerPoint, and I'll let you introduce yourselves and your um, and your project. Great. Well, thank you, Kara. Well, thanks everyone for allowing me to uh, come here and talk to you all. Uh, we are in the middle of harvest. We're actually almost all done. Uh, we had we just pulled our last Cabernet in uh, just two days ago. Uh, now we're just waiting on some uh, late harvest Riesling. This year we're going to make a little more like a Auslese style Riesling. Um, so we'll pick that probably this week. And uh, we're playing around with some uh, port varietals as well. And uh, we're letting that hang for some, uh, to get some uh, extra ripeness out of it. So we'll pick that. That'll be our last pick. We, uh, that'll be our last pick in about seven to 10 days and then uh, we'll be done. Um, so my brother and I started Rasa Vineyards in uh, 2007. We, uh, we fell in love with wine back in 91, and our, uh, uh, we were lucky enough to share the Epiphany wine. For us, it was, um, I graduated college in uh, 1988. My brother graduated in 90, and he moved to San Mateo uh, to work in Silicon Valley. And, um, and he was going to school at night at Stanford for a master's in electrical engineering. And then, uh, then he was about to graduate, and uh, we found ourselves in kind of like a bottle king kind of wine outlet store that was going out of business. And they had the 88 Mouton Rachio first growth Bordeaux on sale for $65. And uh, at that, which at that time it was going for around $250. And we knew it was a huge bargain, but it was also about 10 times more than I had ever spent for a bottle of wine. Uh, we were very new to the game. We knew much more about beers than anything. Um, but we, we bought a bottle and we came home and uh, we both tasted it and it was a revelation. It was like nothing we ever, ever had before. And the next day it was even better. And that really intrigued us and that really started us off on our path towards uh, wine loving and ha having a passion for it. Now my brother and I both have strong uh, math and science backgrounds. We both have engineering degrees and we're both in uh, the IT field. But when we we're developing this passion for wine, we always dreamt of starting our own winery. So in 06, my brother applied to the UC Davis master's program um, for a uh, master's program in viticulture and enology. And they only take, that year they only took 10 people and he was one of them. And I joke around that my brother's a graduate of MIT and, Har uh, and Stanford, and it was probably harder to get into this master's program for viticulture and enology. So anyway, he got in in 06, he called me up and he said, uh, uh, Pinto, what do you want to do? You know, we've been talking about doing this for a long time. And it was the same year I was turning 40. And I said to him, I said, you know, if we don't do this now, we never will and we'll regret it for the rest of our lives. So he quit, he was working at Hewlett, Pack Hewlett Packard in Houston. Um, he went to school full time. I spent 10 months developing a business plan. And as we're doing the business plan, I realized I wanted three things out of our winery. One was to make the best wines in the world. You know, whenever you're talking about the best wineries in the world, and you may talk about, let's say, Mouton or Lafitte in, in Bordeaux or Chab in Rhone um, or Harlan in Napa, we want you to say, oh, and how about these guys, brothers from uh, Washington at, at Rasa? Uh, so that's the dialogue that we want to be in. Our number two was we wanted to be a leader in our niche market. And number three was we wanted to um, give back, change the local economic paradigm and kind of give back to the community and make the entire community more stable. Um, so when we're looking around, uh, we, we were in um, Walla Walla in 07 February. And if you ever come to Walla Walla, just we welcome you, just don't come in February, it's freezing. It's a horrible <laughs> time to come. Um, 
But my brother and I both independently had the same exact feeling, which was Walla Walla in 07 was where Napa was in 86, 87, where Sonoma was in 92, 93. And we saw this trajectory before us and we knew why we weren't the first to the game in Walla Walla, we certainly w were there early enough. So we decided that uh, even before Billo had graduated, we're confident we can make great wines. So in 07, we started made two wines, one got uh, 94 points um, and one got a perfect rating. And, um, and th we started and since this, we're just finishing our 14th harvest and we've just been building upon our success to try to make the best wines we possibly can. So I did create a, uh, um, I did create a little slideshow. So, um, you know, the one question I get asked often is like, why Washington State? Why did you pick there? for a place to grow uh, great grapes and great wines. So when you're when you're looking for a, a great place to grow, you always have to be, three main things you have to be concerned about are climate, water, and, and the soils. Um, so the climate is basically, when you think about climate in, in winemaking, you think about it in three ways, uh, macro, meso, and micro. Macro climate is the climate of the region. First of all, can it sustain high-end grape growing. A uh, mesoclimate is the climate around your vineyard, uh, which could be different depending on if you're on a hilltop or a valley, or if you have trees or you don't, a lot of things can affect the mesoclimate. And the microclimate is typically the climate within the row or the canopy. So um, if, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, oh, well, we already told you to start with the Occam's razor, but I'll tell you uh, before we go into it, um, as you're tasting the Occam's razor, I'd like you to really focus on, um, so just some information about this, predominantly a Cabin Syrah, 15% new French oak, 80% native, and I will get into, if you don't know what native fermentation is, we could get into that in a little while. 25% uh, whole cluster, again, we could get into that in a little while. But I'd like you to concentrate on its uh, um, elevated acidity and ripe but not overripe flavors. That's a, those are good markers for Washington fruit. If you were to compare that with Napa, let's say if you had this wine blind and we'll talk about blind tasting later, um, that's, those are markers to really look for um, along with the good fruit concentration and good, a good uh, fruit intensity. Let's go to the next slide. So back, getting back to climate, so you know what, what was it about uh, uh, the macroclimate of Eastern Washington? Well, when you think about macroclimates, they're generally broken down into three categories for great um, wine growing. One, one is the Mediterranean climate, uh, which is uh, long growing seasons with more moderate to warm temperatures, little seasonal changes. So places like Napa, Adelaide Hills in, in uh, Australia or Tuscany in Italy, a maritime influence, which is uh, kind of the middle ground between uh, continental and med Mediterranean. And places like that, you think about Marlborough in uh, New Zealand or Bordeaux or Rios Beixas in, in Northwestern Spain. And continental, the continental is um, Eastern Washington. It's uh, often inland away from large bodies of water that can moderate temperatures. So we have huge seasonal uh, changes, hot summers, cold winters, and more importantly, we have wide diurnal uh, variations. Be between That means uh, within a day, there can be a swing as much as 40 degrees. In the summertime, we could be as high as 100 degrees during the day, but at night, it'll cool down to the low 60s um, or even just around 60. Next, please. So why is uh, Eastern Washington a continental desert, basically it's a semi-desert. Uh, it's because of what's called the rain shadow effect um, caused by the Cascade Mountain Ranges. Can you go to the next? Now this is very important. This is really what makes, gives Washington its ability to grow great grapes. So I just spend a little time on this. What basically happens is the Cascade Mountain Range basically splits Washington into Eastern and Western Washington. So uh, what happens is as this warm, moisture-laden air in the, over the Pacific Ocean travels eastward, it hits land and it starts increasing. So as the warm air rises, it cools and the pressure changes and that causes, and that means it can hold less uh, moisture. So you get more precipitation. 
So as it hits land and it goes towards Seattle, you'll get about 30 to 36 inches of rain, uh, precipitation a year. Then it'll keep going eastward to Packwood, where Packwood will get about 60 inches, uh, 56 to 60. And then it, ri it rises up the Cascade Mountain Range, which is an elevation of 14,000 feet. So at the very top of the mountain range, you're getting about 100 to 110 inches of, of precipitation a year. And then as you go down the other side, the, uh, the leeward side of the mountain and goes uh, uh, eastward towards Yakima, Yakima, you're only getting about eight inches. So what's very interesting is uh, Packwood and Yakima are only about 55 miles apart, yet the precipitation is going from 60 inches to 100 inches down to eight inches. And, and without that Cascade Mountain range, well, Eastern Washington would not be an arid desert and you would not be able to grow great grapes. Can you go to the next? So just the other great wine regions that have the rain shadow effect, I just put this here for your information, uh, Alsace, uh, Mendoza, Central Otago in New Zealand, Piedmont, Rioja. There's a couple other, but these are probably the most important wine regions aside from um, Eastern Washington that, that are all affected by the rain shadow. Next, please. Uh, this is, you know, if you're, uh, this is probably a good time if you wanted to try the uh, axiom of choice. So this is a 100% Cap Franc. 40% uh, new oak, again, 100% native fermentation, 25% whole cluster. Again, you're looking for that elevated acidity, ripe but not overripe uh, flavors. Uh, I think this has a higher fruit concentration and fruit intensity than the Occam's razor. Uh, now this 100% Cap Franc, I chose to make it because I just love this vineyard. It's predominantly from uh, a Weinbau vineyard. Uh, so there are, uh, you know, there are different styles of Cap Franc. Uh, you, you can make it a full-blown heavy, uh, and you'll get you'll find that in like Paso Robles or Napa. And you know, for personal preference, uh, if you're going to make it a full throttled uh, wine, you might as well make a make it a, a my, you might as well play with Cabernet because there's very little distinction at that point. Or you can make it more in the Lower Valley style from like say Chinon. They tend to be more angular and more acidic. Um, and over here, I think you get a nice middle ground where I think it's quintessentially Cap Franc. And I don't know how long you've opened these wines, but if you've had decanted it, I think Kira asked for these wines to be decanted about an hour. You should be able to pick out some floral notes. I always get some like rose petal or violet notes in here. That's quintessential Cap Franc. If you're able to have a wine blind and you have these nice acidities that are similar to Merlot and Cabernet, yet you have a, a slight tinge of herbaceousness and you get this, this uh, floral characteristics, you could always, you could pretty much say, I think there's some calf Franc in there and you'd, you'd be right. Uh, can you go to the next? Um, before we go to the next one, would you talk about uh, going back to the Rasa, the o Occam's razor just for a second. Sure. Your recommendation for pairings and Kind of why that's your house red, why you chose those those as the blend. Um, um, and and sure. if wants to interject afterwards, I'll ask you for your tasting notes on, on these first two wines. Um, and if you have any questions before we go on, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 by the way, anyone could interject any time. I think the best way to do it is to just uh, type your question in the chat and Kira will read it out. I want this to be interactive and fun. I mean, that's the worst thing to be just sitting there listening to someone talk. Um, so yeah, please, this is supposed to be fun. Um, so the, why the blend? The, the blend came out uh, just by a happenstance. Um, I'm actually not a fan of the Cap Syrah blend, generally speaking. Uh, I, I think it's just usually done because uh, uh, just as a, uh, as a something to try different. But for what, because what happens is typically in other parts of the world, you'll have a cab that grows really well and then Syrah doesn't grow well or Syrah grows really well, but then the cab doesn't ripen fully. And when you blend them together, there's never this harmony um, that I find. So I'm not keen on that blend, but in Eastern Washington, you, we can get Syrah to ripen fully and Cabernet to ripen, ripen fully. So we're not blending to get rid of problems. We're blending to, to enhance the quality to make 
to, uh, to make something that's greater than the sum of its parts. So that's how we stumbled upon this, this blend. And then we, we just, just, to add, uh, just to flesh it out a little, we added a few other things. Um, you know, we have some Grenache and some Tariga Nacional and Merlot and, and uh, uh, Cap Franc in there, but it's about 70% 70, 70 ish Cabernet Syrah, about 72% uh, more Cab than Syrah, but very close. And the name Occam's Razor, it's, uh, so all our uh, labels and the winery name, they all uh, mean something. Uh, the, what we decided to do was since we were new to the game and since we were coming from um, IT and we didn't have any infrastructure built into the wine world, we decided that what we would do is uh, um, tell our story. And, and all these wines have a certain story behind them. Some are more meaningful than others. Um, the, the uh, uh, Occam's razor is it just a simple life philosophy. Um, it's a scientific heuristic, which basically means given all things are equal, the simplest answer tends to be the right answer. So that really shows up a lot in research, for example. Let's say you're, a, uh, uh, you're, you're researching for a solution for a, a certain type of cancer and you have a certain amount of funding and you look at all the things that could cause cancer and you come up with a list of 100. Well, it's best to, given all things are equal, you, it's best for you to go with the, what, what is the most obvious because that'll be the best use of your dollars and more than likely that's gonna yield you the proper answer. So that's what Occam's razor means. I think there's a question there about whole cluster. Can you? Uh, it... Yes. So the question, so for uh, Tawana, um, um, I, I'm going to translate here. Um, the whole cluster, why is it important to the structure of the wine in terms of why would you destem some wines before fermentation, some yeah. wines with all whole cluster and sometimes partial? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, so typically, you use whole cluster to get a little extra tannins from from the rachis. Uh, so you, you would never whole cluster, let's say Cabernet, Merlot, Cap Franc, because they already have a lot of tannins. So you want to whole cluster things that typically are maybe lacking a, in a little bit of tannin. For example, Syrah, uh, Syrah can be whole cluster. Uh, Pinot Noirs are often whole cluster. Uh, things that can add a little character and, and a little uh, nuance and a little more structure from the, from the tannins in, in the, in the rachis. But you have to be careful. Uh, what, and what happens is every year, um, now there are winemakers, I mean, philosophically I disagree with, but it works for them, I guess. Uh, there are winemakers that'll say, we always 100% whole cluster or whatever. I think it's a mistake uh, because you have to taste. I, I'm, I'm in the vineyards actually literally chewing on the stems and the stems will, will guide you. If the stems need to be ripe enough so, so it depends on how the ripeness level of the stems. I'll make a determination as to how much percentage I want to, uh, to use as whole cluster. And the other uh, little added benefit of whole cluster is what happens is you're literally taking the, the whole clusters and putting them in a bin. And, and what happens is, uh, it, I mean, if people are familiar with carbonic maceration, that's a, a, a intercellular fermentation that happens and that, that gives a very fruity wine. And if you think of um, Beaujolais Nouveau, for example, that's all carbonic maceration. But what happens with whole cluster fermentation is since all of these are whole berries, you end up getting a little carbonic, just maybe like 1%. So that adds a little fruit complexity. So when we do whole cluster, I'm getting a little extra uh, fruitiness and then I'm getting the nice tannin structures I want. Um, and then before we go on to more of the QED, um, when you talk about stumbling on the new blend and how do you decide, does it change every year? Do you have an idea going into the vintage? And I'm going to segue that into the question from Tony and Jenny. When you start a new wine, are you looking for that vineyard to make the wine or are you looking to make the wine and pick the vineyard as a result of the wine you want to make? Oh, okay. Uh, well, okay. Those are two uh, great questions. Um, the first question is, uh, we go through a lot of blends, a lot of blends about for the, uh, uh, since there's so many components in the, in the Occam's razor, we easily go through about 80 to hundred blends. And the, uh, and actually for our QED convergence or our Q, the red blend QED, uh, which we'll have in, uh, as yet the third wine, 
we'll go and and actually the perfect union we're going through about 80 to 100 different blends um and the way we do it is is my brother and i we don't know what the blends are our cellar master pulls all kinds of samples and uh um we'll taste them and then i'll say or my brother will say something like well let's try a, a you know let's try a, a two-fifths Syrah, uh, one third cab, and you know, and a two percent uh, Merlot or something, and uh, and we'll try these different blends, and we won't know uh, what the blends are. We'll pick what the best one is, and then we'll keep playing with it. And uh, what's interesting is what what happens is um, when you're blind tasting, when you're blending, things are non-linear. And so what that, what I mean by that is you could add a two percent of Petit Verdot, but it could have a fifteen percent hit. Or you could you could add, you know, twenty percent or something, and it it, it has a two percent hit. And the only way to know is by you trying. Um, and the other thing, when we're looking at blends, I'll tell you because we do once in a while we allow some uh, uh, customers or friends to to join us, and they think it's fun because they get to taste all these wines, but they always get tired out because we're doing about 60, 70 different uh, tastings a day, and it becomes a marathon and you know, your palate really, there is really such a thing as palate fatigue. Um, but when you're looking at wines um, from a barrel and you're trying to project out, you know, because we make wines to age, all the critics say our wines can age 20, 25 years. Uh, so you want a wine that tastes good, young and ages. So we're almost, actually, we have to not think about the flavor profile. So when we're tasting it, we're only thinking about the flavor profile as long as in the sense that are we getting anything that's off? Uh, if, if there's anything that's bad, like volatile acidity, acidic acid, things like that, then, then that's an issue. But we're not focused on, wow, I love this blueberry expression in this blend. Uh, let's make it, let's capture this blueberry. Because what happens is by the time you bottle it and sell it, that blueberry expression will be gone and it will have transformed it to something else. So what you're looking for when you're tasting these wines blind when we're putting the blendings together is you're tasting for a certain amount of fruit concentration, fruit intensity, uh, um, uh, the way it feels on your palate. It, it, if it's a, a, a nice mid palate, good strong attack and a nice finish. So you're really looking at the structural components, not really worried if you're not getting any bacony notes because it's a Syrah and you want, you like to have a little bacon notes. You don't, those things will come later. Okay, now I went. I, I really vamped on that question. I forgot the second part. What was that? <laughs> um, in terms of the vineyard selection, so does your vineyard tell you what you're gonna make, or does the once the you pick and ferment the wine, does that which comes first, the chicken or yeah, the yeah? That, that's a great. That's a great question, and 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 uh, the answer is both. It depends. You know, sometimes uh, we want, like for example, we're playing, gonna be playing around with port varieties. Uh, we're looking to make a vintage port. So obviously that dictated the vineyard. So we, we searched around for a site that was growing uh, Toriga Nacional, Toriga Franca, Tinta Cao, Tinta Souza, and they got the right climate. So that dictated getting that vineyard. But since we've been getting great ratings, we've actually had top-notch vineyards saying, hey, we'd love to make some of our fruit available to you. And would you like to work with it? Um, so then, so that we get the vineyard source, it's like, okay, well, you know, let's see what we can do with that. So. It, it really depends. But the bottom line is we're always just looking to make the best possible wine that we can. So we're never, uh, uh, we never say we have to make Alcan's Razor every year, every year or QED Axima Choice. From a marketing perspective, yes, absolutely. We want to do it every year. But if the quality isn't there, we don't make it. So there's been a number of years, like, uh, um, you know, uh, we have a Riesling that uh, Sometimes we don't get to make every year because uh, Riesling just wasn't the style we wanted. Uh, so we have wines, we have wine called Tilting at Windmill um, that we don't make every year just because, you know, so it really is dependent on, on the quality of the, of the fruit. Awesome, great. Can you go into a little bit more of the Cabernet Franc then? Um, a couple questions about the labeling specifically of this wine, the Quadrat Demonstratum um, yeah. and um, Axiom of Choice. Yeah, sure. So, um, so when we started the winery, we were trying to come up with our first wine label. And my brother and I, like I said, we have a strong math backgrounds. And my brother had uh, uh, said, joking around, said, too bad we can't use QED. Now QED stands for Corderat Demonstrantum. And at, base, at the end of, uh, basically when you're doing a mathematical proof, 
at the end of the proof, you write QED. And it basically means I've proven what I set out to prove. So I laughed and I said, yeah, yeah, it's too bad we can't use it. But the more I thought about it, I'm like, yes, if we are going to engage our consumers, it, it's important for them to know our journey from where we were to where we're going. So I called my brother and I said, hey, you know, I know it's esoteric, but I think it's a great name for us. So, uh, um, and, and at the same time, what was happening was all our friends and family were saying the same thing. Hey, you guys know a lot about wine, but can you make good wine? So I said, let's call it QED and on the back of the label, let's put the proof is in the bottle. So our 07 QED is the one that got 94 points. Um, so since then in 2012, uh, we needed to make a line of wines. We had a line of wines called PB wines, just for Pinto Billo, our names at like the $38 price point. Uh, but what was happening with that PB name, uh, we couldn't put a trademark around it. Uh, it wasn't really enforceable because there was a winery, uh, there was already a winery, a vineyard and a, a beer manufacturer with PB in there. So we we're thinking about uh, names and uh, I happened to have a Microsoft uh, um, marketing guy uh, in, in our, at our winery. And, uh, and he said, hey, I love your wines, but, but this name is horrible. This QED is, it's a horrible name. It's too esoteric. No one will understand it. You really need to change the name of your, your wine. And then we said, okay, I just thanked him and he left. And I said, he says, we won't sell, but we sell out of it every year. <laughs> it's our biggest seller. So, uh, uh, so then I, I thought about it and, and actually a, a suggestion from my, uh, from my cousin, uh, who's the one who kind of convinced me to do it. Um, I decided, well, let's get even geekier. So instead of going away from the name QED, let's make QED into a line of wines and we'll differentiate it by its sub names, which will be even geekier uh, math terms. So uh, axiom of choice is a, is, a, uh, uh, is a set theory name. So our yellow label QED axiom of choice is always our cap franc. Then now we have a, uh, the red label, it, it, the 09 QED that you're having is now called QED convergence. Then we have a, a QED, uh, a blue label, which is always a, a cab Merlot blend that's called the strong law, which is the strong law of large numbers. Um, and then we have a, an orange label QED called reductio ad absurdum. So, uh, and, and we do great with it. I think, you know, the, the important thing is that people, uh, understand that this is genuinely us you know we are we are uh, uh lack of a better word we're geeks <laughs> we were geeks and and now we're making wine and so i think qed just fits in nicely with with uh, the theme of our winery awesome well we're nerds over here too so i really <laughs> appreciate that um and um yes yes we we like to nerd out about these wines specifically um one of the questions that i wanted to get to was about the um um, the, and vintages. So with the consistency of Eastern Washington state being so consistent and not having crazy weather patterns, um, how have you seen vintages change over the last few years? Has there been a di big difference and has your ratings really been vintage, um, 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 variable? Yeah. So, um, the, the nice thing about Washington and maybe a slight knock about Washington, Washington is always fairly steady in their vintages. Uh, so that's been, you know, so in, in, in one sense and probably as grape growing, that's a nice thing. But uh, in another sense, like uh, uh, one wine critic, I said, oh, you know, Washington wines make the same wines every year. Uh, and that's just not true. I, I mean, there is certain consistency in the vineyard and the, in the vintages, but every year is different. And, 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 uh, um, What's interesting is to get an understanding of the differences in the vintages. Um, so what happens is I'm in the vineyards all the time and every year, why, so we've been making this our 14th vintage. So only two vintages where we have been very cool, which is the 2010 and the 2011 vintages. All the other vintages have been very warm and we're able to, to ripen fully, but each of those vintages have their hallmark to them. Um, for example, some some vintages. So when you think about ripening grapes, you're you're actually thinking about two ripening things that are going on. One is the increasing of um, sugar accumulation and the decrease of acidity. Okay, so if you have a grape 
in June before variation, they look like little green things and they're gonna be very acidic and not sweet at all. After variation where the color turns, you start getting more sugar accumulation, you start uh, getting more anthocyanins and, and more uh, phenolic development. So then you're looking for this sugar development. And the second thing you're looking for is what's called phenolic development, which is a flavor development. And those don't go necessarily hand in hand. They both happen later in the, towards harvest, but there are some years where the phenolic development happens earlier, some years where it doesn't happen until much later. So you have to be in the vineyards all the time. So typically, um, you know, we want to pick our grapes at around 25 bricks. And, but some, some years, um, you'll get the phenolic development early. That allows us to pick a little earlier at 24 degrees bricks, and we get a little lower alcohol. Sometimes we have to wait till 26 degrees bricks to get the phenolic development. So there are subtle changes, and each vintage does have its own stamp on, on, the, on the wine. And we're very sensitive to, to getting the grapes at the ripeness levels we want. So I'm in the vineyards every day tasting and, and you know, when I think it's ready to go and I'm looking for a certain uh, uh, intensity of flavor in my mouth when I'm tasting the grapes, um, then, then we pick. Awesome. Well, I think everyone really was digging those Cap Franc, um, especially just how different it is to, we do a lot of Loire Valley Cap Francs and Virginia mm -hmm. has a lot of Cap Francs and this has such a unique mm -hmm. characteristic. So um, I am in love with it. I'm a huge Francophile. So um, um, I appreciate this wine a whole lot. Um, Thank you. Would you like me to go to the next slide? Yeah, yeah let's go to the next slide. So the, uh, the next, the, the important thing is, is the, uh, uh, water, obviously. Um, so basically vines need about 18 inches of water annually. Um, we, we only get uh, like, because of, because of the, the rain shadow effect, uh, Yakima Valley only gets about eight inches. Red Mountain only gets about five inches. Walla Walla is probably the wettest um, AVA in Washington, but we're still only getting 12 inches. So what we need to do is uh, we need to augment that uh, with supplemental water. Uh, luckily for Eastern Washington, we have um, lots of underground aquifers that we tap into. So we get the 18 inches that we need. Um, so the, the, the interesting thing I'll tell you uh, is something for you to think about. And, and by the way, um, you know, there's, a, there's a wine reality and then there's a wine marketing. Okay, so everyone wants to put their spin on wine marketing. So I, I hear this uh, and it drives me crazy. I'd rather just people be truthful. Um, so for example, here's, here's something I, I hear that drives me nuts is uh, when a winery says, oh, uh, we don't drip irrigate, you know, our, 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 because then that implication that our wine, uh, our wines are natural. We don't drip irrigate because it's better. And that's just utter, utter nonsense. Uh, you don't drip, for example, Bordeaux doesn't drip irrigate. That's also because Bordeaux gets 36 inches of rainfall a year. They get as much rain as Seattle does. Okay, just so there's no need to drip irrigate. The, the only reason that Bordeaux makes much better wine than Seattle is because they have much better soils. But though they get too much water, you know, and 36 inches of water is too much. Uh, but you know, but but you'll hear someone from a, a you'll hear a Bordeaux saying, uh, "We don't drip irrigate." Well, no kidding, you know. Uh, the bottom line is your vines need 18 inches. So if you can get 18 inches of, of, of water, then there's no reason to drip irrigate. So actually, I like the fact that drip irrigating, we get to really dial in and just give the water, uh, the vines the exact amount that we need. Then we do something called uh, deficit irrigation where we're stressing out one, one part of the root zone. And, and you know, when you, when you stress out these vines, you actually end up getting better flavors, better... Uh, development. So we, we get to we get to manage that through farming, where if you're getting a lot of rain, you're not going to get to do that anyway. A question real quick about the irrigation, then, if you're irrigating and the water is only, you know, getting down 36 inches, how do you manage the balance between when you irrigate, how you irrigate to make sure the root structures are going deep enough, that you're still getting enough water? How do you how do you do that? Okay, well, uh, um, why don't I answer that question when we go through soils because that kind of ties everything in, okay? And then make sure I do that. So let's go to the next. Uh... Uh, 
Okay, so the, the third part is soils. So like I just said before, Bordeaux gets uh, too much rain uh, comparable to Seattle, but why can they make amazing wines? Because it's their soil, the soil is fantastic. So uh, basically the soil, the most important things about soil is it provides anchorage, water uptake and nutrient up uptake. Anchorage is obvious and important. If you can't anchor the vines, you know, rainfall or wind can knock it over and then you know, it, you can't grow anything, right? So you have to have soil that can anchor the wine. And the most important thing is you want uh, the roots to be able to uptake water and nutrients. So um, when the roots get water from the soil, what happens is water acts as a solvent. So it's uh, the nutrients are dissolved in that water. And so they're getting potassium, uh, nitrogen, all these things through the water, through the root system. Um, so what happens is, the soil's water retention properties and drainage uh, properties, they're both um, have to be, they're, they're opposite, but they have to be in the right amounts. So what I mean by that is one, you have to have proper drainage. For example, you don't want uh, water to just puddle up, right? So nice gravelly soil, even if there's clay, there needs to be some a good drainage. It can't be all clay where it can just soak in all the water. There needs to be some drainage capabilities so you drain away the excess water. That's important. The other thing that's important, but at the same time, there has to be a little bit of water retention. So what happens is um, in a, in case of a drought, for example, where you haven't had rain for a while, the, the roots need to find that water in the soil. So it, it just needs to have a, enough water retention and a lot of drainage capabilities. So um, uh, if you go to the next screen, please. So in Eastern Washington, uh, we have that. Uh, basically, our the, the takeaway, you know, we, these are the different uh, soil types we have, but the takeaway in, in Washington is, is we have very sandy uh, soils uh, that provide great drainage. They have adequate water holding capacities and they allow for deep root penetration. Uh, so that one, what makes the soils so important for a component for Eastern Washington for high-end grape growing. Now to get back to your question, is uh, so when it when it rains, uh, what what you're looking for is uh, enough enough rain where it, it's going to go through. So most of the root system happens to be within the first 36 inches of uh, right underneath the topsoil. That's where most of the root system is, and then the older roots will go down deeper. So if you're getting rain, that 36 inches, they're going to get that water. And then if you're not getting rain, it's up to that, the root system below it that are going around and sending out feelers, feeders to find water and get that from the, the uh, soil retention capabilities. And that's how they're getting water. Okay. Awesome, thank you for that explanation. Um, one other question before, um, and I love your tasting notes on these wines too. Um, and how you've seen this vintage uh, that we're tasting the 2017 vintage differ from others. But um, the question about the, um, sorry, in terms of like a specific variety that is the variety of Washington state, obviously Oregon has its Pinot Noir, California really focuses on Cab and Sauv, uh, Cab Sauv and, um, and, and Chardonnays. But with Washington, you can grow virtually any grape variety. So do you think that that is the positive? Is there, a, is there a con to that? And would you want to focus on any one specific grape type or type of blend? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's another great question. And I, I think it, uh, I think the, I like the, we can grow pretty much anything. Uh, Washington is really, Eastern Washington is more about what it can't grow than it can because it's hard to find a great spot to grow Pinot Noir, for example. Uh, there are pockets where you can. Uh, for some reason, Zinfandel doesn't do very well um, in Eastern Washington, but most of the grapes can grow very well here. So um, to me, that's an advantage because as someone who is a wine lover, um, you know, I, I love all different kinds of wines. So I'm able to make the styles that, uh, kinds of wines that I, I enjoy making. And, um, but the, but the negative side to it and what's, what's happened in the past is just because you can grow good grapes in a certain vineyard doesn't mean you ought to. What I mean by that is, you know, in a certain spot, I can grow Merlot 
well, but it's really suited for Cabernet. You know, so I could grow amazing Cabernet there, or I can grow good Merlot there, right? So I think what's happened in the Washington industry, because everything can grow well, people just planted whatever they wanted to plant, knowing that it's going to grow, right? The, what's happening now is people are starting to realize, hey, yeah, I'm getting I'm getting a pretty good Petit Verdot from here, but it's really not suited. Petit Verdot is a very late har uh, late harvesting uh, grape. Uh, you know, it, it typically cools here by October 10th, and I'm always fighting. So let me replant it instead of making a decent Petit Verdot. Let me make a really good Syrah or something. So what's happening now is people are looking uh, cl more closely at what can grow great here as opposed to what can grow well. But that's the I evolution. That's 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 just our evolution, and I think. Uh, consequences of, of that is just our wines are going to get better. And 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 I have seen that um, every vintage just continues to blow me out of the water. So, um, and other so one other follow up question on that that I'm just curious about in terms of all your blends, if you could only focus on one area, like say Bordeaux blends or Rhone style blends or your Portuguese and Spanish <laughs> varieties, if you could only make one blend for the rest of your winemaking career in Washington, what would it be? Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, I, 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 it's funny. Uh, I think just because of my personal preference, it would, it would probably be um, um, left bank Bordeaux style. But that's a personal preference. That's not, I think, uh, um, you know, what I look for inspiration to make the best wines, I look towards, uh, for Bordeaux style, like I look towards left bank Bordeaux. For uh, Syrah styles, I look towards Northern uh, Northern Rhone, uh, sp specifically Cote Roti and Hermitage. Um, if I'm doing like Grenache blends, you know, I look for inspiration from uh, Chateauneuf. You know, I look at, uh, we, have a, we have a blend that's a very much in the style of a, Priorat, which is a blend of Syrah, Grenache, and Cabernet. So I get inspiration from a lot of these uh, places, but again, I'm never copying them. I'm, uh, you know, I, I draw inspiration from them, but but my wines, I, I want them, I want them to be just as good, if not better. But as a personal preference, I'd probably go with the left bank Bordeaux style. Probably because that was your first love, that Mouton Rosh child, '88. Pro probably, yeah, probably. You know, the funny thing is, uh, uh, well, I, I, and to be honest, uh, uh, it's just also the selling of it. You know, it's just easier to sell Cabernet than it is the Syrah. Uh, you know, the, our first wines were Syrah-based wines, and we were predominantly Syrah-based wines because I felt strongly that it's one of the best places to grow Syrah. In fact, we own 25 acres of land in the Rocks District. That's going to be planted to mainly Syrah because I think that's a spot right there where Cabernet will grow, but Syrah is really uh, what's gonna be the benchmark over there. And that Syrah is gonna be considered one of the best in the world. We've already started making wines from there under a label called Veritas Sequitur. Uh, very, we've been very happy with it. Awesome, I can't wait to taste. So the perfect segue into the um, community, the convergence, the Syrah blend, mm -hmm. we have the 09 vintage up. Um, yeah. I'm gonna go to that screen and I yep. just want to ask in advance, I know you don't co-ferment the V&A oh. with, with these wines. If we do. This, oh, you do? Oh, yeah, yeah, we do. I'm sorry, I thought on your website it said that they were all blended, like they were fermented separately before blending. So I'm Yeah, yeah, no, uh, yeah, or maybe I'll have to look at the wording of the of the uh, website. Uh, the Syrah and Vionia are co-fermented together. The Grenache is made separately, Mouvedre is made separately, and then we blend the components together. Okay. It makes no sense to uh, uh, co-ferment a Grenache and Mourvedre. So, so there's a uh, there's a misconception that you know that co-fermenting makes possibly a better wine. It's 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 not really true. So co-fermentation co has a technical meaning, which is like when you're co-fermenting, let's say Syrah and Viognier, uh, you actually. Oh shoot! I really apologize. Let me find my phone and turn it off. I'm sorry. No worries. While he's doing that, um, I'd love for everyone, if you are tasting these wines, um, hopefully you're tasting along with us these wines, um, please let me know your tasting notes so, uh, in the chat room so we can chat about these wines, especially as we get into the next couple. Um, I'm so excited about trying uh, this 11-year-old wine. So go ahead. Um, yeah, so uh, 
So what happens is when you when you uh, ferment Syrah and Viognier together, you actually get a darker color, even though Viognier is a white grape. And the reason for that is the way their uh, platelets, the color platelets, the anthocyanins stack. And because of a specific way they stack, you get a certain density and it gives the impression that the color is actually darker. So in, uh, in the Northern Rhone, I'm sorry, I'm just muting, I'm just muting my phone. Uh, so in the, in the Northern Rhone, they've been doing this for, uh, for quite a while now because they needed that darker color. We don't need uh, the, that, we get a plenty of sun. So we get the anthocyanins that we need. We don't do it for a darker color. What I do it for is more for the, the floral characteristics I get out of it. So if you're tasting this 09, uh, and, and you're getting this fruit and now you're getting this tertiary characteristics because it's uh, 11 years old. And you'll also get this slight uh, floral characteristic and that's just the 3% Viognier that you're getting. But you couldn't get that same thing. Like if I, if I co-fermented Grenache and Viognier, you wouldn't get the same, same things that you would with Syrah and, and Viognier. That's great. I've, I've only heard one other person describe the co-fermentation like that in terms of the color spectrum and how it changes. I always grew up in the wine world understanding that the enzymes of the white grapes were actually breaking down the, the molecules of the red grape skins more, pulling out more color extraction. So can you, can you, as a fellow nerd, can you walk me through that process one more time in terms of what it's doing? Yeah, uh, well, well, okay. So, so, um, so what I'm saying is the likely cause, I don't think there's been a hundred percent consensus on it yet. Uh, and what you're saying is, is, is possible, but not likely. So, so basically uh, the, the color molecules it, it are, are what are called anthocyanins. And, and uh, the anthocyanins uh, have certain pigmentations. The red's obviously gonna have red, uh, the, the white wines are gonna have more of a, a yellow tint or a golden tint to it. Uh, and it's, it's, the, it's the way the, the platelets, the anthocyanin platelets stack between the the white grape from Viognier and the Syrah grape, the way they, they, they stack it a, a peculiar way where you actually, the perception is the fruit is actually darker. Awesome, great, thank you for that explanation. I love it. Um, and we talk about the soils of these, you were talking about the, the Rocks River District um, and the White Rocks in, in terms of how similar that is to Chateauneuf de Pop, I know. So, soil types of this and why this is going to be such a such a such a badass Syrah region. Yeah and I'll tell you um, um, the well actually uh, we can uh, well, well we'll get there but I'll, I'll talk about it now since you brought it up. The uh, the rocks district the soil types people compare them to Chateauneuf de Pop because they have these huge rocks like like they do in Chateauneuf but the difference is in Chateauneuf those rocks go down about three feet where in the rocks district, those rocks go down about 70 feet. So it's, yeah. <laughs> so it's a very rocky place. That's, that's, that's incredible. Um, will you walk us through this 09 uh, Syrah? I know it was, it's been out in Virginia for a while. I think I sold the last of it last year and I thought it was out. And so when Darcy said that she could get more shipped in for this event to do the 09, I was so excited. Will you tell us how you think this wine has changed? And um... yeah, I, I got to tell you, I'm really happy with the 09. Uh, this was a, a one wine that, so this is our third vintage. And, and I thought the 07 and 08 were definitely better. Uh, 09 was very hot vintage. And I thought it lacked a little acidity. And, and you know, you really, uh, I mean, it was still in balance, but for longevity, I thought the acidity wasn't there. And I couldn't have been more wrong. Actually, uh, the 09 ended up to be better than the 08, which I thought would not have been the case. 08 was a little cooler vintage, and I like a, typically a cooler vintage wine. Um, the 09, I think, is just developing fabulously. It's, uh, it, I think I'm still getting a lot of primary fruit character, and, and the tertiary characters are kind of uh, peeking through. Um, it, it's got a good longevity to it. I, I love the finish. I love the... The, the mid palate of this wine, I think it could go easily for another five to seven years uh, without a problem. And, uh, and I think, again, this, this just highlights uh, actually good winemaking. And you know, my brother's the one who made the, this wine. And, uh, um, and I just, you know, from the get-go, it always tasted good. And I was actually uh, 
honestly, it was a pleasant surprise that this wine has aged so well. Uh, I, and I've been really extremely happy with this wine. Awesome, I love it. And since y'all are so new, um, just in terms of um, overall perspective, in the winemaking world, when you talk about aging your wine for 25 years without having the experience of your specific wines aging in 25 years, will you explain the thought process of a taster and a winemaker when you go into tasting the wine, figuring out how long this wine should age and when you should actually open it up? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, and of course, you know, there, there's a, uh, there's a saying, uh, and I'll paraphrase it, uh, the, the, uh, the French drink their wines too young, the English drink their wines too old, and the Americans drink the wines just right because they don't know any better. And uh, that, that's, so, uh, but, but basically what happens is when you're, when you're trying to decide how ageable the wine is, you have to look at the wine in its totality, all the components, the acidity, uh, the fruit content, the fruit intensity and concentration, the finish, the balance of the wine, they all have to be in harmony. If they're not in harmony, the wine's not going to age. Um, so if they are in harmony, then then you have to, and, and the tannin levels, then you have to just project out, out how long it can go. And it's really based on the the, uh, the high fruit concentration uh, and the fruit intensity of the wine that will help you to push it out. So if you have a wine that's out of balance young, it's possible some wines will find that balance later on, but most often, it's a it's a, a misconception that unbalanced wines will be balanced later on. Um, sometimes the, there is a difference though. So sometimes what happens is you'll have a wine young and it'll be very oaky and say the oak is out of balance. And yes, you could make an argument for that, but it, um, it's a little semantic. It's not really out of balance if you're looking to age the wine. There's enough oak in there that the wine will carry. You're just drinking it at a point where where it seems out of balance, as opposed to having a wine, let's say very low in acid and very high in tannin, which is out of balance, that wine, you could age it all you want to, you're never gonna increase the acidity. You know what I mean? So that, that wine is always gonna be out of balance. So there's a little distinction between what I mean by out of balance as a, as a young wine. I, that's one thing that I always notice about your wine specifically is the balance, the, the acidity, the fruit, the tannins, the alcohol is, is reserved. You're not trying to be too French, uh, but you're not trying to be California. Um, you handle that so well, and it's always been really impressive. Will you actually talk about the different roles that you and Billo have in terms of like what you do in the winery? Are you two of the people that do the same things, or do you really have separation of roles? Yeah, so... Uh, um... When we first started the winery, um, I ran the winery and my brother was the winemaker. But uh, even, even then we had a, a, a unique situation. So uh, the winemaker is the one who decides on when to pick the grapes. That's, that's frankly one of the most critical decisions to make. But uh, ever since the beginning, um, I'm the one who always decided on when to pick the grapes. And we just had this trust in each other that even though my brother is a winemaker, that he trusted my palate to, to make decisions on when we think the fruit's ready. So that's the way we worked. And I learned a lot from my brother as far, you know, I helped him with all the practical stuff as far as, you know, I had a very specific idea on how to make the wine as far as what I want my wine to taste like. And I'm a very much of a textural eater. So it, it wasn't good enough that the wine tasted a certain way. It had to also had to feel a certain way on my tongue. And for example, I'll say like, if you're having my wines, I think, I think the analogy is my wines are more, uh, the tannins are more like, cashmere or silky like as opposed to wool and that's a good analogy and that's because I, I definitely want that uh, as a textual experience so I've sat down with my brother and said these are the things we want for our wines and, but my brother is the one uh, who would make that happen and I would help out I would do punch downs and sorting and I would decide on the fruit and I learned a lot of hands-on and then in uh, 2018 we swapped roles and my brother became uh, the person running the winery and I became the the head winemaker, um, you know, and I, in 2018, I relied on him for his input a lot, 2019 less so, <laughs> this vintage less so uh, to where, you know, I mean, this vintage, I'm quite comfortable hardly going to him except for just certain uh, technical questions. But, you know, and that's the way we worked it because when we started the winery, we both wanted to do everything. And uh, this has worked out well. We, we both kind of 
help each other uh, to to and we both feel very satisfied. It's been a it's been a great uh, relationship actually as far as a business relationship goes, and and we're very close as brothers. So, you know, we we went out of our ways to create an environment where both of our voices are heard. If we really disagree on some things, we would say, okay, you know, I'm running marketing. If you really disagree, you know. You, you say what you want to, then I decide and likewise on winemaking side. But if we still really adamantly disagreed, we just agreed to go to a third party arbitrator, let someone else make a decision. And, you know, we stick by it this way. Our relationship isn't hurt. Um, but we've never had to do that. But it's good to know that, you know, we're we're very sensitive to each other's, uh, uh, you know, desires. And we, we both love the same thing. So it's not like a big compromise or anything. We both know what what it takes to make great wine. And and our stylistically, we're we're very well much in tuned to what we want to do. Awesome, I love it. Work brings the family together, and uh, you at least have it in writing what to deal with. In terms well, it can, it can break families, the, uh, so I have to be very careful. That so, That's fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, a question about the ABAs, so American viticultural areas designed by the government. Yeah. And there's geographical areas, and and you have to get approval for those. Since Washington is definitely newer um, yep. on the wine world in terms of California, are there new AVAs that are yeah. in the process of being developed? What are those and what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I tell you what, I have the uh, next four slides. Why don't we go through them really quick? It talks about the AVAs. So we'll just quickly go through them. So Washington right now has 14 AVAs. Uh, uh, Columbia Valley is the big AVA. It encompasses 99% uh, of all wines produced. Uh, it, it includes almost all the AVAs, um, all the AVAs you might have heard of, uh, Walla Walla Valley, Yakima, Red Mountain, Horse Heaven Hills, Waluk Slope. Uh, they're all sub AVAs of Columbia Valley. Um, go to the, so uh, there are some new ones. I honestly don't know. There's a couple of new ones that 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 are going on right now. I honestly can't tell you the names. I know the. Uh, the Rocks District was the one that we just got two and a half years ago. Uh, Rattlesnake uh, ABA was another one that got uh, that just got uh, I think it just got its ABA status a couple of years ago. Um, so here I just highlighted a couple of differences between the ABAs, um, some of the bigger ones. Red Mountain, you know, this this typically the warmest site, five inches of rainfall every year. They have to the wells they got to go down. They go down 550 feet. To 600 feet to get any water uh, over there, so it's expensive to grow grapes there. But they're full-bodied uh, tannic. Uh, uh, the Red Mountain AVA is probably the most tannic AVA in in this country. Um, deep black fruit. There's some minerality, uh, but it's the tannins that really set Red Mountain apart. Really, I, frankly, uh, we make a wine from Red Mountain called Plus One Cabernet, and it's all about tannin management. If you want to age Red Mountain wines. You have to get the tannins in control. Otherwise, what will happen is as you age them 10 years or plus, the fruit starts dropping, the tannins haven't resolved, and you have a very dry, you know, very astringent wine without a little, uh, with little fruit. So you want to manage the tannins up front properly from Red Mountain. But they make some uh, great wines. Uh, can you go to the next one? I think we missed one. Did we miss one? Walla Walla. Had to mention Walla Walla. That's that's where my wine is at. Um, so so the the Walla Walla AVA, like I said earlier, is the wettest AVA, but with you know 12 inches of rainfall. Um, the way you can tell Walla Walla for me is it always has an elevated aromatics. There's always a perfumey note to uh, to the Walla Walla wines, and uh, to me that's a great uh, marker to pick out. The difference if I'm having a Washington wine and someone says here, tell me where in Washington it is. It's usually the uh, the elevated aromatics helps me point towards Walla Walla. And if you go down to, I, I put one more up there. Uh, and this is the where uh, we own our land, 25 acres in the Rocks District. This is the a uh, sub AVA of uh, of Walla Walla. Though. So Walla Walla AVA actually juts into Oregon by about seven miles. And in the Oregon area is where the predominantly the, uh, the Rocks District is, is in the Oregon side of the Walla Walla AVA. So our land is actually in, in Oregon. We have 25 acres there. Um, this is the area we're talking about with the huge big uh, cobblestones that look like Chateauneuf-du-Pas, but we go 
70, 70 feet deep where they go three feet deep. Um, it gives great drainage. The, the vines really struggle. Uh, they make very distinct, uh, Harvest Diamond has uh, been on record from a wine spectator saying this is probably the most distinctive example of terroir in this country. Um, I love this area. And um, if you get a chance, you should try one of my wines from the Rocks District uh, or from anyone else for that matter. Um, just so everyone knows, I will give a full list of all of their wines that are available, pricing for all of their wines, so you can stock up. Um, but speaking of stocking up, if we stock up now on this 2013 vintage QED Convergence, the Syrah blend, will it age the same way this 2009 has? That's been a question. We have. I think so. Time. Yeah, I think so. Uh, absolutely, because you know, from the uh, from the onset, we wanted our, wanted these wines to be uh, 20 year wines. Um, and, and I absolutely think uh, all these wines will, will do that for sure. Um, but you know, I, I, when I'm having the wines now, like even that 09, I like to uh, I like to just decant it for an hour. If it's a younger wine, if I pour like a 16 QVD convergence, which we're releasing in November, I'll even decant it in the morning to have in the evening um, to with, with my dinner. Yeah. So. So when you do that, you do always taste it in the morning first to make sure, right? Always. <laughs> always, yeah. always have to taste. Fabulous. <laughs> By um, the way, that's the best time to taste. When we do our blending trials and stuff, we do it at uh, 10 a.m. It's it, the best time to critically analyze wines, honestly, is in the morning, without doubt. All my neighbors think I'm a, just a total alcoholic because they always, I, they see me out of my patio drinking wine at 9.30 in the morning, but you're right. It's the best time yeah. to uh, yeah. analyze wine. Um, <laughs> I love like that uh, someone just toasted a, uh, Someone just said the breakfast wine. There, there you go. <laughs> yes, yes, I love it. I want to spend the most time in terms of tasting notes talking about the next wine. Um, and part of one of the questions that I forgot that I think is perfect segue into this wine, in terms of like how you decide on pricing, what goes into that? Is it just the quantity of the wine that you make? Is it the, the age of the vineyards? Is it the type of oak you use? How expensive the barrels are? Can you talk about this wine why it's so much higher end um, and what you love about this Left Bank Bordeaux blend. Okay, well, let's go ahead and click on that so then uh, um, and talk about it. So that's a great question. And, and the uh, a answer to that is, uh, you know, I, I, I price the wines um, where, where I think it belongs in the marketplace. Um, for example, this, this perfect union, actually, I believe this 14 got a perfect rating from uh, Rand Seeley of uh, Review of Washington Wines. Uh, to me, this is a, so uh, to me, this is, it, this compares with $500 Bordeaux wines, $500 wines from Napa easily. But in Washington, I can't charge $500 for a bottle of wine. I would love to, we only make you know, 120 cases of it, right? But, but I do wanna, I do wanna respect the wine. So it's, we sell it for 115, which we can sell out at $115, but, uh, so, so the, the, the pricing we look at, you know, we, our competitors, I never look at my competitors at other Washington wineries. My competitors in my mind are worldwide competitors. My competitors, Harlan, Screaming Eagle. These are, I understand that these are $2,000, $3,000 wines, but I, in my mind, I said, my wine's gotta be that good. So when I think it is, and then I price it at 115, I think it's a huge bargain, right? From a Washington standpoint, they tend to be, other Washington wines, uh, there are very few other wines that are at 115 in Washington, but I have to respect um, the quality of the wine. And, the, and then the quality is uh, assessed again by what the, the, the quality of the fruit, frankly. With the quality of the fruit is so high, the way we assess the quality of the fruit is a combination of um, fruit concentration, a fruit density, fruit intensity, and then the balance of the wine and, and uh, how complex it is. And you can get you can get a feel for that right away when you've tasted enough uh, barrel samples. And then we price those wines accordingly. Um, so so, uh, uh, so that's that's where we price. So we have, we have in, generally speaking, we have the wines at a $115 price point uh, retail. Then, then we have some, uh, like we make uh, unique wines like 100% Grenache, 100% Petit Verdot that are priced around $60. 
Um, then we have the QED range price at 38 to 50. And again, why that? So a, a, a case in point is that the axiom of choice, um, the calf pronk you just had. Uh, Stephen Tanzer, one of the world's renowned wine critics, has been in our winery and has told my brother face to face, they said, why aren't you charging $75 for this wine? So we told them the reason we're not is because we get a lot of uh, millennials through, uh, uh, and, and we wanted to introduce a, a wine at $38 that, that, you know, that may be more than what they're used to spending, but, you know, it shows the quality and the style of our wine and we want to include everybody. And he just looked at my brother, he goes, you're making a mistake, you should price it at 75. So, but, you know, uh, we could price it at 75, but the thing is we want to be, um, I know our wines, you can look at it as hey, all our wines are expensive. If, if wine is just a commodity drink for you, then all our wines are expensive. You know, then buy yourself a $5 box of wine, drink it and be happy, right? So, and that's perfectly fine if that's, I mean, I assume that no one here feels that, but if, uh, you know, I mean, certainly my parents, they buy a $5 bottle of uh, Riuniti or whatever, they're, they're good, right? And that's okay. But if you are uh, willing to spend $20, $50, then there still, still should be some perceived value, right? So when I make my $18 Occam's for me, it should compete with a $40 bottle of wine. When I make a $50 QED, it should compete with a $100 bottle. When I make my $100, $115 wines, it, they better compete with the best out there. I don't care what the price point is. So that's, that's our philosophy. Well, you do it so well. Your wine's always over deliver. It's unreal. Thank you. Um, I know you mentioned your parents. Um, because of just this this label, the the name, in order to form a more perfect union, mm -hmm. and you talked about your parents. I know they came here to the U.S. and yeah. you all came over. Will you share a little bit of that story? Yeah. So so this is one of the labels that that has a real personal story. Uh, so when I was coming over the name for this wine, you know, it was a. Uh, 09 was the first vintage, and it was a, at that time, it was a blend of three grapes. It didn't have Petit Verdot in there. It was Cab. The 09 had Cab Merlot and Cab Franc, and it comes from uh, about five different vineyards. So I was thinking of a name for it, and I thought, oh, uh, three grape varietals, uh, varieties, five different vineyards. Perfect Union is a great name, but it didn't really tell a story. So I started thinking about my parents. Uh, you know, I was born in India in 68, 66. My brother was born in India in 68. And my father left his young children and his wife behind and came to this country in 69. He landed at JFK airport with a little more than $5 in his pocket, um, roomed with a, a friend of his. And uh, a few of his friends were going down to Miami for, uh, for a master's for an MBA. So my father said, okay, I'll, I'll join. So he went with them. He ended up becoming a valedictorian and he came back to New York. And during the, uh, during the day, he worked as an engineer. And at night, he drove a, a taxi cab in Manhattan. Now he's 81 now and he still drives like, you know, he owns the place. He's like, he's a, a taxi cab driver in Manhattan. So anyway, he, he, uh, he saved up enough money to bring my mother over in 72. And my mother, um, was a finance and accounting major. So she worked in finance and accounting during the day. And at night she was a checkout clerk at a local department store. Um, and they saved up enough money and then brought my brother and me over in, uh, in 74. So I thought about that perfect union theme. I thought about my parents' journey. And so I decided to use the first line from the preamble to our constitution in order to form a more perfect union to celebrate their journey for their version of whatever the American dream was to them. And I thought it, it tied in well with the food sources and the varieties. It is such a beautiful story and truly the, the American dream. Um, yeah. And um, that, that's so wonderful. Thank you for sharing that very personal sure. story with us. Um, will you talk to us about this specific wine, the 2014 vintage is what we're drinking. What was this vintage like? Why did you, choose this specific blend of grape varieties. I know you talked about blending a little bit beforehand. Um, maybe we can get into native yeast fermentation instead of inoculation now and how you choose how much percentage of new oak to create the style of wine that you like. Yeah, um, I just saw uh, something that Susan Darty posted. They are proud of us, uh, my parents, uh, thank you. But uh, when we started our winery, 
they were aghast. I mean, we are now. I don't believe in the caste system, but uh, you know, uh, we're we're Hindus, and uh, and and we are Brahmins, and within Brahmins, there's subcategories. So we are the highest Brahmins that you can be. So not only am I not supposed to be making wine, I'm not even supposed to be drinking any alcohol. So once we started making wine, my parents were just beside themselves. They could, you know, we spent all this money for you guys to become engineers and this is what you're doing. Um, so, but they came around, they saw the passion we had, uh, they saw how happy that I was and, and my brother was. And so they've, they've become our biggest supporters. But yes, they, they are very proud of us. <laughs> um, the, how do we come up with this blend? This, so we never decide, hey, ha, it, we always decide on the blend for the perfect union by the vintage. Uh, you know, what makes the best blend? Or even if it deserves to be a blend, you know? Um, sometimes we might say, ah, oh, this is just not good enough to be a, a perfect union. So uh, we typically start off by having um, a little more cab, though we're not tied to it, we tend to have a little bit more cab than any of the other grapes just for the uh, tannic backbone. And then we flesh it out with the Merlot and the Cap Franc. The Cap Franc has a nice floral characteristic. Uh, the Petit Verdot adds a nice uh, um, structure to the wine. Uh, 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 Petit Verdot, we're getting a darker color. We're getting higher acidity. Uh, from the Petit Verdot. Uh, we're getting more of the, the black fruit from the Petit Verdot. Cabernet is giving us a, a hint of uh, herbaceousness, a hint of bell pepper, um, but we're getting the, the, the blackberry type of notes from the Cabernet. The Merlot is giving us some cherry notes and giving us a, a silkiness to the wine. The Cap Franc is giving us a little floral aspects with some nice acidity. So it's this beautiful balance and, and, and it's a weird blend. So there's no way I can say this is the blend I want. This is the blend we got. You know, we, we tried so many different blends and then we decided on, well, you know, I, I can remember doing this blend. We started off, we had, we had the Cabernet Merlot and Cap Franc in proportion that we wanted and it was lacking just a little something. So we, I remember starting with just like, let's add 2% Petit Verdot. Then we said 4%. And I remember going all the way up to 20% Petit Verdot. And that was, they ended up, that was too much. Uh, and ended up at 11% Petit Verdot was just the right amount to, to get everything we want out of these wines. Again, what we do is we taste it all blind. We have our favorites uh, and we don't know what the blend is. Uh, and then what happens is if I like something as the best and my brother likes something else as the best, we'll talk about it. If we can't come to agreement, we said, uh, no worries. Uh, we make notes of the blends. And then a couple of weeks later, uh, we'll do it again. Our cellar master will make those blends with a couple of other blends and we'll sit down. We won't know whose blend is whose and we'll, we'll pick this way. We're never advocating our positions. We try to take our ego out of the, out of deciding and that's a great way for us to do it. So this way we're not advocating for what we think is the best. We're just picking what we think is the best blend. Um, so that's how we ended up with that. The, uh, uh, the old pro, I'm sorry. Real quick, I want to interject a question. Do you make bets ahead of hand, uh, ahead of time? Like, I bet my my like. Do you? Make <laughs> no, no, we don't. <laughs> That's funny. Thanks a lot. I'm glad my brother's not here to hear that. You're just looking for us to fight, aren't you? <laughs> I uh, I'm the middle child of seven, so um, oh. it's very competitive in my family. So there you go. <laughs> this is part of, part of family life for me. So um, all right, continue about your blending. <laughs> That's funny. No, no, we don't do that. And then we decide on the amount of oak. The amount of oak, um, so our philosophy is we never like to over oak wines. The oak should uh, should act, help help with the structure of the wine. Uh, you, um, so our, we only have one or two wines that we use 100% oak on, and that's only because we feel it can handle it. Uh, most of our wines, most of our Bordeaux blends will get up to 70% oak. Um, most of our Syrahs will get anywhere from uh, 20 to 60 percent. Uh, again, and, but again, that Veritas Sequitur would be the exception that gets 100 percent because it could it could really handle it. So it's dependent on what what it could handle. Now we only use French oak, and not because I have some bias against American oak. I'm, one of my favorite wines is uh, Ridge Montebello, uh, which is a 300 dollar bottle of Cabernet that is just uh, incredible, and that's all American oak. But for the style that we make, I find American oak to be too aggressive. 
So uh, there are different there are different species of oak. So an American oak tends to have a, a more um, vanillin in there, so you get more aggressive vanillin notes, and it also has a, a hints of dill. It, it literally will. Uh, if you're ever having a wine blind and you you get oh uh, uh, this red wine and you get dill, it's a good indicator that that's American oak. Awesome, great. Um, and speaking of what you drink, you were saying, um, um, you mentioned what you were drinking earlier. Do you still drink Mouton Rothschild? Uh, do you drink Clove Road Guard, which I know that was uh, one of your favorite wines in terms of that, the- That's my, yeah. So so that's my absolute favorite winery aside from Rasa. Uh, uh, yeah, the, again, a, a couple of brothers from, uh, from uh, uh, the Laura Valley uh, started the winery. Um, uh, to me, when I make my calf franc, I use that, uh, that's a calf franc. I, I use that as a, uh, for inspiration. I, I, I think it's the, the best calf franc out there. I, I love that wine, love that winery. Um, they were recently sold, but I think, you know, everything's still intact to keep on making great wines. I drink that. Uh, the funny thing is once you start making wine, you can no longer afford to drink Mouton Rashield. So, uh, so I, <laughs> um, actually, we did have the 88 Mouton uh, uh, um, a year and a half ago. Uh, just my brother and I were at a restaurant and they had it. Now, the funny thing about the 88 Mouton, so that was the first one, that was our epiphany wine. But in, in that in that decade, the 88 Mouton wasn't even their best wine. The, the 82, 85, 86, 89 were all superior to the 88, but the 88 has a, has a special place in, the, in our hearts. But I like to drink, uh, uh, most of my wines I drink are, are not from the US. Uh, there's, there's something called a regional palate or uh, um, and what happens is a lot, of, a lot of people will drink wines that their friends make and you know, things like that. So you, you end up developing a regional palate. It's like, okay, I can, and, I, and my goal was to never to make the best Washington wine. My goal was to make the, the best wines. So I'm constantly tasting wines from all around the world. Um, so, so I, I tend to gravitate towards old world, but, but uh, you know, um, just the other day I had a Argentinian Malbec, and I like what what they're doing in Argentina. And you know, I'll drink wine, I'll taste wine from from anywhere. Um, I just had a really nice Syrah from uh, Swartland in in, uh, in in South Africa. So yeah, it just uh, I'm a, I'm still a wine lover, and I try to taste as much. In the fall, I will tell you, in the fall, it's all about vintage port. Uh, for us, uh, so most the most wineries uh, they don't drink, you know, the winemakers don't drink wine during uh, harvest. They they drink beer. Uh, I can't drink beer because I have a gout issue. My brother too, so I could I love beer, but I can only have it once in a while. So my go-to for the harvest is a, a great vintage port, <laughs> which which I just love having. <laughs> will you um, speaking of port? Will you tell us about your new port project? I know you know Bordeaux has just introduced the legalization of these Portuguese grape varieties because they can handle the better the heat better yeah. um, in terms of climate change. So so going into more of these Portuguese varieties with Bordeaux blends, you were talking about making vintage port, you have some Alicante Bouchette. What's going on in your head in terms of using these grape varieties to combat some of the issues with climate change? Um, well I think uh, I think Bordeaux is doing the right thing and they have to do something. Um, but for Washington, you know, that's not such a, Washington right now for the foreseeable future is the beneficiary of climate change. You know, so much money from Napa Valley uh, is getting ported to Washington because Washington's a little cooler than Napa. Um, so if they don't get climate change under control, then uh, Napa is not gonna be Napa 20 years from now. And uh, so all the money's going ported to Washington. So right now places like Washington, places like uh, Southern England, uh, where they're making better and better sparkling wines, are beneficiaries of climate change. While places like Bordeaux, uh, Champagne, Napa, are are people that are feeling the the problem problems of climate change. Um, for for vintage port, we actually made a vintage port. Uh, we tried to make it twice. Our first go at it. Uh, we used the wrong uh, brandy. It was too pure of a brandy. You need to, uh, when you're making vintage port, you have to arrest fermentation at, at uh, uh, roughly 14% alcohol 
you're arrested by adding a neutral spirit to it that kills off all the yeast. And that neutral spirit brings the total alcohol to around 19, 20%. And that's part of the process of making vintage port. Our first year, we just used the wrong type of neutral brandy and it wasn't very good. Second year, uh, we got a better source of the neutral brandy, uh, made a very good, what I would call, uh, it was a LBV level, a late bottle vintage level. That's the ports you can find at around 25, 20, $25 bottle of wine. But you know, I'm always about making the best. So uh, we drank a few of those <laughs> and, and they just got rid of the rest and we didn't make it. But I was uh, happy that we were able to make a good LBV. Um, but you know, I wanna make a vintage quality port um, so now we're, this is our third go around. I think we found a great source. And I think we're, you know, we always stand a good chance of making it. Yeah. Awesome, very cool. I think you've, you've got a built-in clientele. Like we all want your port now. So okay. <laughs> that's what happens and we'll be your top buyers. Uh, everyone's nodding along. So a um, couple questions just on you looking back at your time now as a winemaker, um, when you started, you obviously, we always learn as humans or we should be learning. What's one thing that maybe you would have done differently in terms of making wine, the fruit that you source, the vineyards you pick, how you choose market, like anything that you're like, oh man, looking back, I would have done it totally different knowing what I know now. Um, um, yeah, you know, that's a, uh, I mean, it's hard to say because, you know, in the first three years, we got three perfect ratings. So, so you know, I mean, we did, we did something right uh, from, a, from winemaking. I think from a winemaking perspective, um, I think I would have invested a little better in uh, uh, like a better press, things that have a better destemmer, you know, things like that earlier. Um, I think that could have made our wines even better earlier. Um, I mean, the fact that we, you know, what's impressive about my brother being able to make these, like first three years, we got three perfect ratings and, and we were making it with inadequate equipment, you know, uh, which is really impressive, right? Um, if we had the equipment we needed, we could have made better wine. So I think initially, um, if I had to redo it again, I'd say, okay, we need to raise a little money or save a little bit more money first and put it into a little better equipment and then, then we're good to go. Uh, I think that would have been the one thing. Um, I mean, we're there now, but you know, uh, that would have even helped us. And the other thing is, I think I would have introduced Occam's razor earlier. Um, we we're just so fixated on the best, the highest, highest. Um, I think we lost an opportunity to introduce a, a intro intro brand, if you will, where it could be a sub twenty brand to kind of upsell to our, uh, you know, to to show our style of what we can do. And uh, so I think I would have introduced that earlier from a marketing perspective. Uh, that that would have definitely helped. Awesome. And last uh, question about the negative sides, and we'll go back to the positive sides. The are there any trends that you see in whether it's wine making as a whole or specifically Washington State wine, where you're like, oh, we need to stop doing this. This is a problem. Um, is there is there you don't have to call out any specific wineries or anything? No, like I would never do that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, only because I feel everybody's got a right to make a living. So I'm not, I don't, you know, there's definitely wineries I don't like. There are definitely wines that, that are popular that I think are disgusting. Uh, but, you know, they got they have a right to make money as much as I do. Uh, yeah, the, the, the trend I don't like is, uh, uh, it's been going on for quite a while now, is, is uh, adding sugar to, or actually fer fermenting it, not totally dry red wines. To me, a classic red wine is is dry. You're having my wines, even if you if you're perceiving any sweetness in in my red wines, it, the sweetness is the uh, is not the sugar, it's the fruit, uh, whatever perception you're having. Uh, because if you have ripe fruit, you'll perceive a sweetness, but uh, sweetness doesn't exist from a. When we talk about you know uh, dry, dry in in wine parlance, dry is the opposite of sweet. Uh, so our all our wines are fermented dry. Uh, what, what happens in a lot of winemaking, they're, they're leaving a little sugar in there. So you get this little sweetness to the wine that, that becomes popular. Uh, I hate that trend. It's been going on for a while, uh, but it's not a trend that I'm, I, I like. I hate, uh, the other thing I hate, this happens a lot in Napa, uh, 
which uh, actually one of the master of wines called it uh, Cabarones, which is they, they're picking these grapes very late, uh, very high bricks, like 28 degrees bricks. They become raisinated um, and then they water back. So you still get a 14 and a half percent alcohol, but you get these overripe raisinated type flavors, um, very much like an Amarone would be. Um, and and uh, I've seen that trend in Napa in particular, and I hate it. Um, uh, not everyone does it. Some still make classically styled wines, but that's a trend I hate. Um, and I, and, I, and I also, I, I hate the, uh, the trend where a certain area will pick a grape just for the novelty of it. Now I make a Petit Bordeaux, but I almost didn't because I didn't want to perceive it as I'm making it just to be novel. Uh, the, the only reason I made it was it really is a fantastic wine. Um, but I hesitated making that because I didn't want to be perceived that way. I hate the, there, there was a time here in Washington, people were making Petit Bordeaux. I'm like, why? You know, this, I know your source, the, that vineyard isn't very good. Uh, just stop making it for the sake of making it. Uh, you know, I wish that would go away. But, you know, but then again, it's, you know, uh, everyone needs to make a living. So if they think they could tap into something and I, I, it's more power to them, it's just not what I like to see. that um i always want the true grid of like things we should all stop doing but no one ever wants to answer that question and thank you so much for answering it so <laughs> on the plus side what are the trends that you see that you were like hallelujah this is amazing that people are doing this um, um and and that you want to see more of oh uh, well the one thing i really like is i think people uh, overall are uh trusting their palates more I mean, this, I love that. You know, I, I hate the idea of only listening to critics. I, I love that people are saying, hey, I love this wine or I don't love this wine. I, I love that. I mean, I think you could always use a critic as a guide, you know, uh, especially if you're in if you're in tune to someone, some critics uh, palette and it, it, it coincides with yours. You know, for example, there's a um, there's a. Um, there's a magazine um, that I know always, always overrates the wine consistently. So, so I know if a certain critic gives it a, <laughs> gives it a 95, I know it's a 91, 92 point wine. So it's good. You know, I can use that information, but I've, I've tasted enough of his wines to realize that, okay, you know, he, he really likes his wines a little too much. <laughs> so, uh, but, but I like the, I like the idea of people just tasting and, and I like that people are trying all different kinds of wines. Um, uh, I, that, that, uh, that I find uh, very exciting. People are trying wines from um, other place areas like uh, uh, Vaccarayas or, or St. Joseph instead of, you know, like the traditional co roti or something like that. Um, I, I love seeing things like that. So I think it's good. I, I like the experimentation that people are doing. That's awesome. That's like the mission statement of Vinoculture. Oh, okay, uh, someone just asked, Okay, I was afraid that I was going to get asked this question. <laughs> what do you think about natural wines? Okay, I, 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 I didn't want to be negative, so I'm going to give you my honest, honest opinion. I hate, hate, hate the term natural wines because it implies that all other wines are somewhat inferior than yours. I hate that. I hate that, that dynamic. Uh, that's one. Number two, most of the natural wines the, the uh, natural wine is a euphemism for bad winemaking, okay? When you're getting all kinds of uh, bacteria in there, all kinds of volatile acidity, uh, all kinds of bread, and they say, oh, it's because it's natural. That's bullshit, that's bad winemaking. If you really wanna make natural wine, you really have to know your stuff. You really have to know everything much more than, than the conventional winemaker, okay? And very few natural winemakers do that. Most of it is bullshit. I'm sorry, I get really, uh, I actually had a, uh, I, I, I apologize. I don't, I, I'm very uh, uh, passionate about this term because I don't like, uh, well, I don't like anything that, that, that says, um, that puts this fake paradigm where you're in one category, you're good, you're in another, and if you're not, that the implication is you're bad. And that's what the natural wine movement does if you're not part of the natural wine movement, then your wines isn't as good, which is absolute nonsense. I so I hate that fake paradigm to begin with. Um, 
So, but, but then, then there's other issues with natural wine. For example, a, a winery makes natural wine. They do, they have, they have gravity flow, you know, no pumping, all gravity flow, but they don't tell you that they spend $250,000 to excavate. So how natural is that? You know, I mean, it's such a moving target, natural wine. Honestly, the only thing, only natural wine is if you happen to go into a forest, you see some vines growing uh, on some tree and you take some grapes off, throw it in a pot, come back to it in a month and drink that wine, that's natural wine. Other than that, there's nothing natural about it. You're, you're trellising vines, you know, what's natural about that, you know? So I don't know, I, I get, uh, um, so I'm not, actually I, I've had distributors call my wines natural and I've told them to stop. Um, because uh, we are uh, we are uh, non-interventionist. We don't want to. So actually, uh, this actually ties in perfectly over here on the uh, perfect union and says 100% native fermentation. So what does that mean? So what that means is we're not inoculating with a known yeast. So native fermentation is whatever um, yeasts are on the grapes, we let that happen. Okay. But the difference is every year you have no idea what's on the what yeast cell, what yeast species are on those grapes and from different vineyards have different species. So you don't know if it's good or bad, right? So if you are a quote unquote natural winemaker and say refuse to add inoculated yeast, you could be making some really crappy wine, right? And then you could say, well, it's natural. Okay, uh, there's nothing wrong with inoculated yeast. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not a GMO, it's just, a, uh, it's just they've, they've isolated a specific yeast and, and made it and cultivated it, that's all. So what we try to do is we try to always do a native fermentation, but but if it goes wrong, if we see there's something there that's causing it to go wrong, then we will inoculate it with a known yeast strain. So this one, a perfect union, for example, happened to be 100% native fermentation. I believe the 09 QED, one of these was uh, two thirds native. So basically two thirds of our lots, everything was clean, a third wasn't, and we inoculated that with a known strain. Because at the end of the day, I want the best product out there. So, um, yeah, I, I've, yeah, as Susan just said, natural wines I've tried has tasted really crappy. I've tasted very few natural wines. I can say this is a good wine. Uh, it's a euphemism for bad winemaking. It really is. And so I'm not a fan. Sorry to go off on that. No, this is brilliant. Um, and I, I love your breakdown. And this like goes into the breakdown of the ratings too. And and if we're if we're just if we don't learn to trust our own palates, then we are fooled by every marketing gimmick. We're fooled by all the ratings, and because we just drink what people tell us to. But as soon as you learn to trust your own palate, then you're not being fooled by these things. And and that's the mission of Vino Culture is to enable people to trust their own palate. So yeah. this is this is amazing stuff right here. Um, for um, um, time's sake, I know I know we've taken up so much of your afternoon, and I can't thank you enough of this, um, uh, just for all of your time and your expertise. For this last wine, um, this is the 2014. When would you like if you had six bottles of this? Um, you're you're a customer. You're not the winemaker. When would you actually open up these bottles um, if you were to buy six? Because I'm trying to get everybody to buy six of all of these wines. Oh, there you go. Um, well, I, I think it's drinking well right now, but it's young. Uh, it, it definitely needs some time. So uh, I actually like, if it's a wine I really like, I like to buy a six pack or a 12 pack of the wine. And then uh, then I like to drink it every once a year or every other year, depending. So with this with this wine, I think if you were to buy a six pack, if you, especially if you just had one today, you buy a six pack, you lay it away for two years um, and have one then, then have one two years. And then, you know, then it's going to be up to your palate. Some people like their wines a little younger. Some people like their wines a little older, but this wine will easily go uh, hold until uh, uh, 2034 without a problem. So you, you have time. And, and I like to see the evolution of the wines. So I like to see how, how they're going along. So that's, that's what I would suggest to do with it. I think it's very instructive to, it also helps your palate too. Then you can say, because you can say, Oh, I think this will age this much. Then you can kind of track it in see if you're right it's, you know if you're if you're into that it's it's good awesome this is um i can't tell you this has been not just the highlight of my weekend this has been like the highlight of 2020 post covid <laughs> um i i can't thank you enough for this um i really hope to actually 
truly visit you soon. And I hope that you. everyone, a part of this group, feel like wants to go out and visit and see the the explosion of the Washington State wine community and um, gets to know some of these other makers. Um, a last final question. Um, Oh, oh, maybe, maybe not then. These library wines, great questions. You, you make so little wine, right? And so mm -hmm. how much are you saving in the library when so, you try to release them? Yeah, so, okay, so uh, we're talking about honesty before, so I'll be honest right here. So, <laughs> so um, basically, we had library wines for um, 07, 08, 09, 10, and 11. Um, we had those wines because of uh, um, we didn't have a place to sell. Like when we started in on our first wine, that was seven was available in 09. Um, we didn't have any place to sell. So ended up we had stocks of these wines, right? So um, we were selling out of most of the wines, but then for like the QD, which was our highest, um, you know, everything we make is around 100 cases, 100, 200 cases. And then the QED was making around 700 cases. So we would have about 200 cases left about it. So then we said, well, you know what, let's just save it for a 10 year library release, which is what we did. But since 12, we actually don't have library wines. So there will be no more. <laughs> yeah. So the library wines are available for 09, 10, and 11, the QEDs, and, and I definitely suggest get some. They're drinking great. Um, we have very little available, like our 12 QED convergence, for example. I literally have maybe 25 cases of it, which I'll just, you know, I'll just offer it up to our uh, collectors club members or something like that. We don't- no, I'll buy it all. I'll buy okay. it all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, done. We can, we can do that. Yeah, so honestly, we don't have, uh, uh, we no longer have any one wine enough of starting with 2012 to offer as a library release. I mean, we have a little bit, you know, maybe five cases of one wine or 10 cases of another, something like that. Um, so I, I, we will do a, a library release. We did a library release for 2010. We'll do one for 2011. But then after that, there will be no more library releases because we just don't you know, I mean, that's the thing about, you see library releases all the time. And when I was getting them, I was like, oh, that's nice. They held it back. But honestly, they're holding it back because they can't sell it. You know, I mean, let's face it. I mean, why would I hold back a wine that I could sell it time to sell it in 10 years from now? You know, um, and that's the truth of the situation. It works out well if you're aging wine, if your wine is ageable, because what we did with our uh, 10 years is we didn't raise the price either. You know, most library wines, 10 years, they, they raise it 40, 50%. We sell it at the same original price um, th that we released it at. Um, but, you know, we did it because we made a marketing mistake. Now, the wines are great, but, you know, we didn't have avenues to sell. Uh, but now we, we just sell out of everything, so. Well, uh, we thank you for not raising the price um, and we'll, we'll, we'll reward that with lots of orders. I, every, when I taste these wines, I tasted these wines with Darcy to figure out which ones. Um, Darcy's the local distributor. Uh, and I'm like tasting these wines. It's like, wait, he's willing to ship off this one at the same price? I thought I was gonna pay double, and I was like floored. I was just absolutely floored. The wines were great, and so for all of you, um, I um, I also got this great deal. Um, um, Billo and, and Pinto decided that they were gonna release a private label wine, so um, a wine without a front label. Um, it is a mix of a bunch of different grape varieties. And so I'm going to design a vino culture label, smacking on these bottles. I got six cases of those. Um, they're not for resale, so no, you can't purchase it, but it's a, going to be thank you presents for the people who have kept vino culture in business throughout this time. So while we have you, will you tell me, will you tell us what's going on with this wine? What's in this wine? And I know it's like the biggest deal of a lifetime. It's, a, it's a huge deal. Bottle. So basically what happened is uh, COVID happened. That's the bottom line. Um, so COVID happened and everyone thinks, oh, it's great for the wineries and it isn't. It's great for, um, so uh, wine sales for $20 bottles and under increased by 19%. Um, the high-end wine sales did also increase a little bit, but they, they were mainly for the known brands like your Camus or your Phelps Insignia, Opus One, you know, wines that are well known. For the small guys like us selling $115 bottles of wine, we took a hit in the marketplace because we, you couldn't hand sell them, right? 
um, you couldn't go to a wine store, first of all, and, and second, they, they wouldn't handle, you didn't have that conversation with anybody. So we were taking a bit of a hit. Um, so what we decided to do is, well, what do we need to do? And we decided that what we need to do is uh, deallocate some of our high-end fruit and create something engage like I, we don't want to discount our wines. I don't want to say, here's my $115 bottle of wine. I'm going to sell it to you for 50, right? Because that, that kills my brand and I don't need to do that. But uh, what we did was then we took some of the wine that was going, going to go into Occam's Razor. We took some of the wine that was going to go into our high-end stuff like Perfect Union, declassified it, and we came up with an idea called private label. So really quick, we make wines for like uh, restaurants that says, you know, uh, made by Rasa for the restaurant name, the restaurant puts their label on it, it becomes their house wine. I said, well, we should do that for everybody. That'd be fun because no one gets to do that. So what we did was we offered a, basically a $20 bottle of wine that punches way above its weight. It's more like $45 bottle. Um, we sold it for $20, only a, a generic back label for legal purposes. And on the front, we say, you put your own label on it, whatever you want, and uh, share that label with us. You know, we'll, we'll put it on Instagram. We'll We'll make a like a fun little community thing out of it. So people have just loved this. Uh, uh, we, we it was so successful. We did the first one in April. It was so successful that we did it again in August, and I think we'll probably do it every year. People just love it. I mean, they really love it, and people have used it for uh, for anniversaries, for to give away as as um, wedding gifts. You know, I was just at a a wedding, and my wife took a case and put. Put uh, uh, you know Jared and Jen's wedding by give a case to them, you know, so they can have. It's it's just a, it, it's just a great thing that we did, and that that really helped us get through cash flow. You know, from a um, from a business perspective, you know, we forego uh, we we forego some uh, greater profitability later on by declassifying our high end fruit, but we got the cash flow now, and it was a decision. You know, we could keep our employees. We didn't have to worry about laying anybody off. And we we're still managing to actually grow. We're going to grow by 10% through all this, in part because of that label, uh, that label, a private label idea. That is so amazing. It's been, obviously, COVID has been a terrible thing to happen for so many people, but it's been really wonderful to see the people who have been inventive and to see those businesses grow and uh, flourish and be a part of that. So thank you so much for sharing your wine with us, your time with us. Um, I'll send everybody the list of the wines, the pricing and um, information. You can take pictures of the bottles, tag them on Instagram and Facebook and um, help promote these amazing people and the amazing wines that they create. Um, and Joe, thank you so much. Tell your brother, Welcome. thank you. I hope to meet him too one day and your yes. whole team. Um, and Please visit. Yes, I we we're already planning in the chat room apparently a trip. I'll I'll lead a trip out to Washington <laughs> State soon. So yeah. Are there any last words you want to leave everyone with um, in terms of uh, any 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 final conclusions? No, I, I thank you all for listening and just uh, be safe and and uh, be kind. Beautiful words. Thank you. And, um, and thank you for your awesome wines and for your time today. So okay. All right. we'll see you uh, hopefully in person soon. Okay. That sounds great. Thank Bye. you. Everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.